and TELUS was really pretty good in terms of uh, employee satisfaction and, and engagement, and therefore that passed down to the customer, right? Indeed. Yep. yep. And at that point, lots of other organizations were looking at you saying, hey, how are you doing that? <laughs> so you started to, you wrote the book and you started uh, talking a lot more about it. You, you were consulting within TELUS, and then you left TELUS to, to do it on a, a grander scale, right? <laughs> and you wrote a couple I more wrote, books. I wrote the genie. That's what I did, Jane. I did this. And out came. Absolutely. Perfect. Perfect. And I popped uh, Open to Think and then The Purpose Effect. And you have a new book coming out later this year called Lead, Care, and Win. And before we finish our talk, I want you to you know, to talk a little bit about that, uh, that new book. But um, what I really was impressed with was how you stepped up and really showed leadership in this health crisis. Like practically right away, you put together some of your previous writings into uh, toolkits to help uh, employers who hadn't been working with remote staff and staff who hadn't been working in a remote way. I mean, lots of us have been doing it for many years, but it is so new to so many people. You want to tell us a little bit more about the, the toolkits or give us some top tips while we're talking about it? Yeah, why don't I start, Jane, first of all, with a thank you for the invite. Uh, how kind is it to have a fireside chat about, uh, you know, things that I've, I've hopefully done to help a few others. So I'm touched by um, the the ask first of all and it's nice to see and, and be around a bunch of people that might be interested in, in you know some of the things I might have done uh, that helped a few people uh, specific to that question I think I'll take us back to March the 8th and the reason being is um, there was like a it was like a slow moving hurricane that was was happening that week i was in victoria on the on the on the monday and it was my daughter's uh 13th birthday so we celebrated a little bit in the morning and and then i had to get on a plane at noon to get to toronto mm -hmm. uh because i had events tuesday wednesday thursday mornings uh throughout that week in toronto and so you can imagine a little bit with the world where it was that week and i was thinking to myself should i be yeah. getting on this plane yeah. Uh, where, where we weren't quite yet at where we were l later that week. Um, yeah. So I got on the plane um, a bit oblivious. And then I, I landed in Toronto and, I, you know, I got to my regular hotel um, down there near, um, near the, the, I still call it the Sky Dome, but the Rogers uh, <laughs> Center. <laughs> and, um, and so... So that night I'm thinking, I started writing, because uh, I usually write every day or wherever, and I just, I didn't write on the plane, I was reviewing my notes for the talks I was giving that week. So anyway, I get back to the hotel and I start writing. I found myself writing about change and when change is thrust upon you immediately. Now, I hadn't even thought about the word pandemic yet because it had not been issued by the WHO. But I was thinking a lot about, okay, what's, there's going to be a huge demarcation happening pretty quickly. Anyway, I do event number one. It's fine. Um, in the afternoon, I had a couple uh, business meetings, uh, regular meetings. You shake hands, right? It's whatever. It's Tuesday now. <laughs> then, um, you know, I said in-room dining Tuesday night. Fine, whatever. I didn't want to see anyone. Wednesday morning, it was another event at, um, uh, at one of the banks. And when I got there... Uh, it was like a full-on Perel parade, right? It was now at the point where everyone was, you know, dousing their hands in as much Perel as they could get. There was no shaking of hands. There was the elbow bumps. And everyone was a bit cautious. They were still gathered right close together, one another. Um, but there was, a, there was a hint of caution there. And there were, uh, in that event, there were supposed to be 400 people and about three quarters showed up according to the event organizers. So now it's Wednesday. And, and so now it's the afternoon and I'm supposed to be attending a concert that night in Oakville. 
uh, one of the members of the Tragically Hip had invited me to a concert because he was um, putting out his first solo album. Wow. And I was, gonna, I was gonna go to Oakville to go be a part of the concert. And then I was walking towards Union Station and I stopped and I said, yeah, no, this is, this is not good. My head just immediately shifted to this is not good. So that was about four o'clock in the afternoon. I turned around, went back to the hotel, and then it was that night on the Wednesday when in no particular order uh, that evening, uh, Donald Trump had blocked all traffic other than the UK from landing in America. Tom Hanks had contracted COVID-19 in Australia and the NBA shut down. <laughs> so now we're at Wednesday and it's the 11th of March. Now, the next day is March 12th, of course. It's my, I have three goats as I call them. It's my other daughter's 17th birthday. And my commitment was to this organizer that I would do the event in the morning, but I had to be out by 12 so I could be at home for dinner with, uh, with Claire. And so I do the event, but as coincidence goes, it's an event with the government of Canada. And this event with the government of Canada was supposed to have, you know, about 250 odd people and like, you know, 40 showed up. And, and, and it's, again, it was a half day thing. I'm out of there at noon. It was a bit workshop, a bit, a bit of Dan talking a bit kind of whatever. And I completely pivoted from what I was supposed to really do to kind of nurturing and, and, uh -huh. and discussing kind of fireside chat ways about empathy and about what's about to hit us and what can we do as leaders uh, in this moment of change, really, a, as Rebecca has noted, sort of a, a point of liminality. And, and sure enough, I, I, <laughs> a couple of people from Health Canada were there and I kind of cornered them a little bit at one point, now two meters apart cornering because I was, I was on to what was happening here. And I said, look, you know, my heart goes out to you. This is going to be a roller coaster for the next little while. I didn't think a year or 18 months. I just said, you know, this is what's going to happen. And um, I said, if I could give you a virtual hug, I would. But, uh, you know, here's an elbow bump. And, yeah. uh, and the event ended. And I got on the plane. And at that point, I was pretty sure because I just read a, 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 I read a I, I'm kind of one of those weirdos where I'll read like, like academic and medical reports for fun. So I had found my way to a, a University of Coventry uh, medical report that had suggested that the virus was airborne for up to three hours. And I was like, yeah, this is a game changer. So having had read that report on the way to the airport, Pearson, then I get on the plane and I'm basically like this because there's no mask for, for anyone. That's when, to long-windedly answer your question, Jane, <laughs> That's when I said, okay, I've got five hours uh, to the time I land in Vancouver and then the little puddle jump to Victoria where I live, for people that don't know. And I kind of sketched out an instructional design document that was, okay, how am I gonna help leaders? How am I gonna help remote employees who have no idea what they're doing? Because from March 8th to March 12th, I saw this slow moving hurricane turn into a cataclysmic bomb and I knew by Monday that the whole place was going to do a 180 and really no one was going to be able to work in an office unless I figured you were a central worker. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, I mean, I'm not saying I'm a prophet. I'm just saying I pretty, was pretty certain that's what's going to happen. So yeah. how can I help? Yeah. And, and that ended with these two toolkits kind of rushed together Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I worked like 18 hours a day, essentially. And then by Monday, I'd uh, kind of put out the first one and then touched up the second one a little bit later on that week and put out the second one. And they've been, they've been downloaded or viewed like 15,000 times now. So All right. yeah. could I have made money off of that? Probably. But I would rather have gotten at least what I've known in terms of how to be a remote leader, remote worker, remote team, remote organization out there yeah. in hopes of helping. Yeah. And, you know, that's what really uh, impressed me, Dan, that you were like right on it. But... I love that term. You are so great with the words and the slow moving hurricane. Exactly. It was like you couldn't, you couldn't even take a breath that week because things were changing so much. That's a, that's, I love that. That's a great term. Um, 
and it and it's just you know our world is so so different from you know several months ago to now when when talking to my my mailman and watching Jose Andres cook in his kitchen are like the highlights of my day. <laughs> it's like pretty crazy. At least you have your goats to keep you um, on your toes. Well, I mean, that, that's, they, they definitely keep me on my toes because as I've been joking a little bit, they're now, uh, because of those birthdays, they're 17, 14, and 13, right. and it's girl, boy, girl. So you've got a 14-year-old yeah. boy with no prefrontal cortex. Right. Uh, Lots of testosterone. So I'm essentially yeah. trying to prevent a homicide from happening every day yeah, in my I, house. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. Well, I, my heart goes out to, uh, to families who have children who are trying to work and trying to, you know, have their children homeschooled and, and so on as well. What a, what a challenge. Well, I tell you, you, you were kind enough to sort of provide a little bit of a bio biography on my history. And, and yes, I did indeed leave TELUS full time on December 31st of 2018. But by January 1st, 2019, i.e. the next day, they had sucked me back in for a couple of retainers. <laughs> and uh, one of them was to continue running the TELUS MBA, of which I, I put together in 2015. And so essentially, that's 20 team members, sometimes 25 that uh, work on an MBA over a two year period through the University of Victoria, of which we partner with. Anyway, um, this week and last week, it was my term to check in with, with all of the team members. And because the third cohort that we're running right now is in the middle of their second term. And so if you can imagine, we had a residency the first week of February, uh, sorry, second week of February. And then, you know, three weeks later, it's like, Ee! <laughs> you know, uh, heads up, you know, there's a pandemic and these are high performing team members. So many of them are on EMOC, which is the Emergency uh, uh, Management Operation Committee. So it's basically, you know, if the end of the world is near, these people go into a whole other level of leadership mm -hmm. and, yeah. and so on. So, so yeah. much effort, so much work in these poor people. But my point is that as I've checked in with all of them this week, about two thirds of them have families. And of the two thirds that have families, about half of them have kids ranging from zero to five. And when I, when I chat with them about, you know, how are you holding up, you know, in your hold up flat, you know, apartment, townhouse, house, whatever. It's, it's amazing how resilient they are as people, but how stressful it is with particularly those zero to five. Yes. There's lots more with five to 18 year olds, of course, but, the ones that need uh, like 100% attention and care. You yeah. can't just say, hey, you know, go, go look at the iPad for an hour. Um, it's kind of interesting. Anyway, I just thought yeah. I'd add that is that you're, you're right. There's a lot of stress going on out there yeah. with families. Yeah. The, um, then after you had done that, Dan, we had been talking about some other things and you had mentioned to me that you were going to put together speaking and I just oh, I yeah. can't believe <laughs> How quickly you put it to how you forgot about that. How quickly you put that together and brought together 35, 40 other authors, consultants, thought leaders, speakers to um, present over the period of a week. So during the week, you went from like 11 in the morning Eastern time to 7 Eastern time every hour, sort of doing 45 minute pieces with people, you know, doing webinars or doing the fireside chats, which were all wonderful. And the, the caliber of people and the, the new books I learned about was, was absolutely incredible. I was so impressed that you were able to put it together so quickly. Well, um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Speak Aid was one of those things where I thought about three different audiences. And again, I, you know, I'm, back to the, that second book, The Purpose Effect, I think I was just using my purpose statement, which is we're not here to see through each other, we're here to see each other through. So mm -hmm. if it happens to be a pandemic, how can I help? Yeah. And you know, I'm, uh, I, I don't like minor details, I'm a big picture thinker, and um, as much as you have to have the details in a book, if you're writing a book or an article, for example, um, I, I thought that the three audiences I was trying to serve in a big picture perspective were being, horribly wronged 
by, by this pandemic. And so in no particular order, I thought about, you know, all the conferences and events and the con like the trainings, et cetera, that had been annihilated by the fact that everyone needed to second themselves to their own house. And so that's a gazillion of people that weren't able to get any professional development. So yeah. I was like, okay, there's audience number one, you could do it for them. Uh, I thought about then like the authors, the thinkers, the speakers, you know, they had seen basically everything scratch from their dance card when, um, when all the events you know, were postponed or canceled in mm -hmm. March, April, May, June, July. And I looked at my calendar and said, oh, look at that. 14 <laughs> events were canceled or postponed. Okay, that's fine. Like, you know, I'll survive. But the third audience was, of course, those that were being um, hammered by COVID-19. And, and so why not take, you know, what I do relatively well, I would say, is big picture thinking uh, with a little bit of uh, grit and chisel my way through um, this idea. Now, I had to be unfair. unfair I started out with, in my head, okay, you know what, I'll do like two days and I'll do like six speakers a day and maybe an hour and we'll have a little break in between. Yeah. And then I woke up one day and I'm like, nah, you know what, let's just do the whole week. Why not? <laughs> See how we do. <laughs> it's, so w within 24 hours, I put a note out to like, I don't know, 80 or 100 speakers and, and all of them said yes. I was like, oh, Jesus, I have too many speakers now. What are we going to do? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so I had to like say, hey, I, I probably have speak A too, but you're, you're, you're next. So we're going to do these folks first. And then anyway, uh, but it was, it was a joy, like to be able to start at eight Pacific, 11 Eastern, get a speaker into the green room, uh, 50 minutes before kind of prep them, get them to do their 30 minute talk and then have like a dialogue with him or him and I, or her and I, uh, for 30 or 50 minutes, sorry, then stop get in the green room, 15 minutes, prep, go to get it. do that eight times a day, five wow. days straight. So I'll tell you this, Jane. Uh, first of all, it's just a joy to work with so many great people. We had 2,000 people register and attend. We raised $33,000 for Red Cross and Red Crescent Society. But on Friday afternoon at four, I was in a fetal position with a bottle of scotch. Just like, oh my God, I, that was a lot of work. <laughs> well, that was going to be one of my questions because I probably participated in, I don't know, two or three in a yeah. day. And I was exhausted. So I couldn't <laughs> imagine how you uh, survived that whole time. But, uh, but yeah, it, it worked very smoothly. Um, people were very enthusiastic there was lots of you know questions and and some of the speakers you know really gave homework as you went along and made you sort of do things which yeah. i thought was fabulous and uh it was interesting to see where people were from you know you know i'm a librarian as a, a, a in training and i was so fascinated to see people from the la public library that were you know, joining uh, SpeakAid as well, which was, I yeah, thought. Yeah, amazing. Like there was like eight or 10 from the LAPL there every, every day. It was great. Yeah, yeah, it was really great. And, you know, I, I, uh, I had a whole bunch of nuggets in terms of, I, I particularly liked your words. As, as I said before, you were great with words. Your quarantine, how you spend <laughs> your quarantine. How are you spending your quarantine? Yes, that's the, the question <laughs> of the month. How are you spending your quarantine? <laughs> but uh, but tell us that you know what what sort of were the big moments for you in in the in the speakade program? What what did you really what resonated with you? Yeah, a couple of things. Great question, Jane, and thanks for attending by the way, and for your donation. Uh, no one no one's bringing that up, but uh, it was touching to see that you, you did that. Um, the the humanity, first of all. I mean, when you have forty different speakers. Uh, maybe aside from me, uh, it was quite interesting to see the different takes on humanity, whether that's humanity of artificial intelligence, whether that was humanity of empathy, whether that's humanity of storytelling, uh, the humanity of, of creativity. Uh, there's just, there was a, it's, it's, it's as though that we now, I've seen through SpeakAid and through the chat and the questions that were coming in from the audience, uh, just a, a wonderful level of enhanced and heightened um, of humanity. So mm -hmm. that, that's what I got out of that. Plus, 
then you add on, you know, um, I had sort of made a mental target of trying to hit $20,000 in donations by the end of the week. And we hit that by the end of the Thursday and then Friday just went gangbusters. And we, we got to 33,000 on the Friday. So I don't know. I mean, just, I guess people may have been waiting and saying, Oh, let's see if it's, or they just kind of wanted to wait to the Friday, but a whole heck of a lot of more donations came on the Friday, which was, you know, like whatever, about 60% more of what we had targeted for by the end. So yeah, Yeah. those were, those are some highlights. And then a, a couple a couple talks specifically were, were a bit more gut wrenching because uh, they really hit you. Uh, they really hit you hard. So, um, and then the last one, Jane, would be the fireside chats with the Thinkers Fifty. So just called upon some of my buddies over yeah. there, at Thinkers Fifty, and, and just having a like like this an honest dialogue, right? Where there's no slides. It's just a right. chat. Uh, whether it was Whitney. Um, Johnson or Roger Martin or Nilifer Mershon, right? Uh, Rita and even yeah. Alex with his craziness. It was just like, it was brilliant to be every day at 10 o'clock Pacific having those fireside chats. Yeah. One of the, uh, the topics that came up that I really, um, really liked the discussion around it was around the, um, skills. You know, how the skills that we see today are not the ones that we're going to be looking at even in a short term away from now and and how do we how do we uh, build for that and how do we take that you know under our wing and and create you know learning platforms and and so on for for all of those kinds of things that was i don't know why it hit me that day but it was really was something you know i know and i've heard before and i've thought about but that particular day, it really, it really resonated with me. Um, what else did I want to ask you about here? I actually uh, wanted. Can I? Can I just? Yeah. Um, Dan, what did you? I guess what did you learn in terms of, or what was different because this was a virtual, a totally virtual uh, networking and learning um, event. And, and a lot has changed virtually since you and Jane and I started working virtually years ago, right? Did you have any ahas from, from the event in that way? So either the technology yeah. or the dynamics, maybe the dynamics is what I'm really after here. Sure, it's a great question, Rebecca. The, a couple, I would say, first of all, you can't, well, I don't think you can, but if you were trying to run a public conference where um, you have people from all over the world, I think you need a platform in which to register, take care of, keep track of, et cetera. And if you were, like my point being contrarily, if you were General Electric or TELUS or a bank, you know, if you have your internal systems already set up, whether that's an LMS or some other system you've already got, I think it's a little bit easier to cobble together what you've got. If you're starting with nothing, <laughs> which is basically where I was. I was a startup enterprise with nothing. Right. How did you find sponsors, Feedloo, and, by the way? What's that, sorry? How did you find Feedloo? Well, that's where I was going with. So oh. um, I, needed, I knew as a CLO or a recovering chief learning officer, I knew that I needed some type of LMS registration system. There's no way I'm going to track emails. There's no way I'm going to like just add people to a zoom call because I had figured, Oh, maybe I'll get like 500 people. That's a lot. And it turns out, you know, I got 2000. So, okay. So I was like, well, I got to look at some platforms that are out there that either are all virtual uh, event type of management systems, or they were hybrids that had a face to face component. And they also had a, a virtual add on piece. And that's kind of what I went and investigated. So I spent basically a day, uh, interviewing and demoing and looking at these types of platforms. And there were four in particular. I won't name them all because that's unfair. But I, I looked at these four and then I eventually landed and decided on Feedloop. And for those that don't know, it's P-H-E-E-D Loop. And it turns out they're in Toronto. So I was like, oh, great, because I'm supporting a Canadian organization in the same breath. So I meet with their team, their leadership team, uh, just to make sure that it's exactly what I kind of wanted it to do and I thought it could do and to jury rig it a little bit because it is a physical event management system that has a virtual component. 
with apps and all kinds of things on the side. But we, we did it. We said, yeah, we can do this. We can make it all virtual. And there were a couple hiccups. Obviously, you'd expect that. Um, but they, they basically gave me half off of what the fee would be to, to use it. So that was kind of in part their, their in-kind donation. Um, and we went from there. And honestly, other than the first talk, <laughs> which they didn't, quite, they didn't quite understand perhaps if I was serious or not, because here we had like 2,000 registrations. And I, I think they were paying attention to that. But at 8 o'clock Pacific on the first day, <laughs> Leanne Davey was our first speaker. God bless her. Another Toronto gal, actually. And um, uh, author of The Good Fight, if anyone wants to know. Yeah. Leanne's amazing. Anyway, so... <laughs> So we broke the server <laughs> because we had like 400 people log in right away and they were like, what the hell? And so we had a, <laughs> we had a bit of a tough start, but by, by quarter past the hour, they had fixed everything and we were ready to go again. <laughs> wow. I hadn't realized that. It was not noticeable. Yeah. The platform yeah. I thought was really, really impressive. I can't believe that it's in Toronto and I didn't yeah. even know about it. <laughs> That's great. Oh, so, needless to say, I became, uh, and I just met with the C-suite yesterday, I became a partner with them uh, to help other organizations do this because somewhat obviously, Jane and Rebecca, the, mm -hmm. the way of the conference is going to change forever. But yes. even for the next year, you know, I, it, depending on the state or the province or the city, you know, I, until there's a vaccine, you're not going to have more than 50 okay. people in a room. Mm -hmm. And at that, it needs to be social distance. So my idea is, okay, how do I help other organizations, yeah. uh, whether it's the KM Worlds, hint, hint, or whether yeah. it's, you know, TELUS, and to put together this package of, hey, this is, I've done it. I did it with 2,000 people and 40 speakers. Like, I tested it to the nth degree, and it worked. Yeah. So yeah. that's why I'm, I'm working with them now to help other organizations bring that type of, uh, oh, I guess. I'm really, glad, I'm really glad to hear that because, you know, I agree with you. I think we're going to be doing more and more. And that was such a, a great example. And uh, one of your sponsors I wanted to mention too to uh, this group in case they didn't know about them was the uh, Get Abstract. Oh, gosh. Those people are so kind. Yeah, yeah. Tell, tell everybody what they do. Sure. If you go to uh, getabstract.com, uh, they're a Swiss company uh, living in Lausanne, and they're quite amazing because essentially their business model is uh, they will take books, like they have all three of mine, they have the fourth one, so they're doing it right now, and they summarize the book into eight pages, and it's uh, like, I'm old, so it's like, it's the old Cole's note version, if you will, but it's in a, um, if you're Canadian, you'd understand that reference. It might be a, a borders note or whatever, if you're American right now, but anyway, um, the, the, and then they sort of highlight the, the key sections and, and the things that you, you, you like the takeaways, right? So, you know, my books are, they average about 80,000 words. So to bring that down into about 1600 words, uh, and it's a subscription model and it's, it's quite good. And again, what it does is it, it highlights the book, but it, it helps you feed, um, other readers to potentially looking at the book in more depth. Right. So. And if you want to check it out, you should check it out because they were giving it away free until like the middle of May. So check that out. But I loved um, um, Roger Martin when, when you were talking about <laughs> it with him. He says, why did I go through all this pain and anguish writing this book? You know, they could have just snapped it right up. He said, I put all the words together, but they made it sound great. <laughs> I loved that. That was really cute. That was really cute. Um, Rebecca, did you have other questions you wanted to ask at this point? Oh, I was just um, <clears throat> continuing on about SpeakAid in terms of, you know, you're continuing work with your clients. <clears throat> and were there any other learnings that you got from SpeakAid in, in terms of people working together and working virtually together that informed how you are now going to work with your clients? Yeah. Um... <clears throat> there's there's a lot of people as you might expect right it's not it's not a it's not um something that's 
unknown uh, or or missing it's that p people miss people and you know the the virtual substitutes pretty pales in comparison to a, an actual hug or a shaking of hand or having a coffee or sharing a glass of wine or whatever right so you know i think we're we're going to have to be as leaders more empathetic and compassionate than ever and it's not a are you an introvert versus extrovert conversation it's just a human connection uh mm -hmm. point so we're we're gonna have to find ways over the next year even with the social distancing right to make sure that we're we have not like the pendulum went all the way over here to work from home obviously so we had no idea how to sort of stop a spread but you know arguably most organizations were over here before and yes there are some good examples of telus and otherwise that were were here i would say mm -hmm. but a lot were here so we went like this and so now we're not sure what we're doing um <laughs> what what's what i hope for is that we do get to here and i'm not meant to be praying by the way but that there's this balance <laughs> of this balance between where you have to be at work and you have to be at home but you, you want to be in the middle and leaders need to be thinking that way going forward. Um, there, I, I keep hate, I hate seeing the term, the new normal, right? Uh -huh. I want us, I just want us to have the great reset. That's what I keep talking about. <laughs> and the great reset is about how leaders finally recognize that it is, it is about these caring, nurturing, empathic type of behaviors that have to be in, in, in um, inculcated across an organization and you whether you're here or here but ideally in the middle of how we're working together that's mm. that's kind of what i'm i've been getting out of not just speak aid to be to be that honest rebecca but just the last six weeks right i've seen such wonderful examples of empathy like honestly i've i've been smitten by the the number of leaders that are leading and that's kind of to your point we chat about offline right about leaders lead in liminal times it's your it's a liminality is those changes the bumps in the road where you're like okay oh so it's a pandemic what am i going to do how am i going to show up for my people yeah. and in more so than ever now when we're thinking about where we work and if ontario goes back a little bit and bc goes back a little bit and certain states go back a little bit what does that mean what's the leader going to do in the great reset uh, to make sure that they're not being a jerk like they were before, not to forget their employees, that they're just a number in a spreadsheet paying them every two weeks, that there's more to it. And that's why I think the Great Reset, you know, I said this before, that there's in the shadows lurk opportunity. And this pandemic is one of the biggest shadows I've ever seen, but it's also the biggest opportunity. Yeah. So let's take it. Yeah. yeah. Sure. One of the things um, I found interesting recently, I had to, to talk with a, a bank by phone because there was something I couldn't do online. And as I was chatting with the person, the person was really, you know, talking to me about, you know, how things were in my world and putting human interaction into a, you know, a telephone conversation. And I, I was reading something the other day that talked about digital only life so instead of in real life we have digital only life and um how we have to look at injecting human interactions into that in various ways which is exactly what you're saying but uh well so you know back to the conferences example right <clears throat> So we're in training. So yeah, we might be able to have training sessions of 15, 20 people, as long as the room's really big and it's two meters apart, but we're not, we're not going to have, you know, 200 people in a room for the next year, let's say. And if you look at like what Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Salesforce, and what's the other one, um, Amazon have done, they have, they have canceled all face-to-face -face partner, employee, uh, and customer events to June 30th, 2021. Right. So that's a harbinger for me. And yes. when those folks are saying it, then the rest is going to fall, right? Yes. Or follow suit. Okay. So how do you create and if not recreate a, an experience like that, that's not just talking heads in a 
in a, in a web call or a Zoom call or WebEx or whatever. So it, at TELUS, I'll take you back 10 years to be mm -hmm. dating myself. In 2000, just, well, at the end of 2010, going into 2011, or 2011 sorry, I instituted something called TELUS Collaboration House or TCH. And TCH was a virtual world. And the virtual world, if you're unfamiliar with what that basically means is you came into an arena and that arena could be uh, a conference room, a training room, a meeting room, an open air environment, an aquarium, didn't matter. We built all these different rooms as an avatar. Yeah. And you got to dress your avatar. I mean, you couldn't be a three headed fish or, you know, Sinbad the sailor, but you wore like professional stuff. And, you know, I wore a hat as I usually do. You would be able to walk around this virtual arena and in, in its arena, there would be like, you know, up here, there'd be a, a panel where the video would be playing and that could be whoever's speaking at the auditorium mic. Over here, it could be slides. You could sit down in a chair and watch. You could go around and mingle and chat with someone. Anyway, here I am now outside of TELUS and, and the company that made that product uh, went, went bankrupt. Or, sorry, they didn't go bankrupt. They sunset the product. And they're like, no, we're not building that anymore. I was like, well, that's too bad. That's too bad. So, but this past month, I kept noodling in my head, wait a second, why aren't more organizations not thinking about virtual worlds? Because there's a way in which to at least uh, take the physical nature of walking around a conference room or the exhibitor hall or looking at a speaker and then having a chat with your mate to the side of you about what was just said. How can you bring that back for the next year and a half or so, if we're not going to have face-to-face -face conferences with 200 people. So again, I went into my little analytical research brain and found four companies across the planet. And I honed in on one. And, and now I've signed a partnership with them to bring this idea to other organizations or conferences because it's, it's gonna be part of the great reset that you can have like a half day, a full day conference, maybe even two days in a virtual world because we're not going to be able to be physical face to face, at least I think for the next 18 months. Yeah. Oh, we're so glad you brought that up to him because later this month, we actually are chatting with another Nexter who was one of the founders to the uh, Call of Duty uh, franchise. And he has a product called Roomy that Roomy? we're yeah. to uh, play around with. Okay, you got you to gotta hook me up with Rumi because well, maybe absolutely. that's a better one than what I'm looking at right now. I hadn't heard of Rumi. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, so in the first uh, three weeks that we were shut down, I uh, so I started to think about Second Life. And people yep. were laughing about, you know, whatever happened to Second Life. Well, to me, these things are always just pilots, right? It's like, test it. It wasn't ready for prime time. Okay, fine. But we learned a lot from that. And so I ordered my Oculus uh, goggles and nice. uh, um, because we have a buddy in Florida who has been using uh, VR with goggles to teach, <clears throat> right? Taking students into yeah. that environment, which is exactly what you're talking about. And, uh, and I thought there's got to be a way here to bring leadership teams in <laughs> that can't be physically together, that are, you know, they're spread across the country or whatever, um, for decision making. Because there we were with our post-its and our whiteboard. And yeah, uh, yeah I've got this 10-bound thing on my head. But anyway, we'll get past that. <laughs> but yeah, so he's, uh, so Chance is going to come on. His name is Chance, yes. Yep. Um, Chance the Rapper? That's amazing. Good, that's it. Good, that's good it. Because uh, that's what we were using was Rumi. And, um, and so our, our librarian friend, Chad, um, has been using it for... I don't know, two, three years as it's been progressing. And this, yeah, I'd love an introduction. I mean, you quit got it. Well. You definitely awesome. will. And, and the part that we really liked about it was that you could wear the Oculus thing and do more, but you could be in the room without that and do a limited amount of stuff. So uh, cool. we really thought that was cool. So uh, uh, anyway. Mary, D, Mary D in the chat said, has anyone looked at Verbella? Mm -hmm. I have not looked at Verbella yet or VIR oh. Bella. Can yeah. you tell us the one that you're going to work with, or is that not yet? I'm under NDA right now, to be okay. honest. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, 
we'll, we'll get back to that another day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so some questions we should uh, we should allow uh, for some questions here. Rebecca, have you seen any on there, or do you have others you wanted to ask? No, but interestingly enough, um, <clears throat> Patricia Sporinelli. Anyway, from Get Abstract. <clears throat> was an exhibitor at the military library's training workshop in December. So oh, <clears throat> let's hear it for them. That's yeah. hilarious. That's great. Um, really what you've been talking about, Dan, uh, and it's, so until I get somebody else's question, I get to ask mine, um, yes. <laughs> which is, and, and why you're here, because yeah. you're next Nexter, and as I uh, said to you, too, that, uh, you know, I really see you as a Canadian treasure, because Canadian uh, treasures, right? take things from where we are right now that you get an idea. Like, my God, man, in the past three months, you had an idea about virtual and that everybody else is gonna be virtual, about putting together a conference and now taking it to the next step. And, you know, we all know that people really, they stumble, they have ideas, and they honestly don't know how to move it forward. I have to say, if I didn't have Jane, as a business partner, I, I, I would often be stuck in the idea phase or I'm in the execution phase. I don't have the idea, I have the execution phase. So talk to us a little bit about, you know, what you've learned over the years about how you do move from the idea to the execution and then most importantly to how you do a, a debrief or a post-mortem or whatever wonderful word you have for it to actually learn from it because you're a learner. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what a touching question, actually. Because uh, I have to talk about myself, which is not anything I really like doing. But um, I, uh, I suppose there's a few things as I'm thinking out loud now, uh, which is always risky when something's being recorded, but let's go for it. Um, I, I have a, uh, I, ha I definitely have a curiosity type mind. So I'm, I am unafraid to try anything, you know, um, <laughs> it's, it's March 31st and I look at myself and I said, huh, I'm, I'm not going to be on stage for a while. That sucks. So yeah, what the hell, uh, on April 1st, I'm going to take a photo of my shoes and I'm going to post it to Instagram. And I'm going to post another pair of shoes every day in April because I have like 50 pairs of shoes, which is sad, but that's, you know, another story. And my shoes are eclectic. Like they are red They're shoes wild. from Wizard of Oz to John Fluvogs to whatever. So it's like, yeah, why not? Why not just try and who cares? Meaning I, w I would rather try and fail or try and learn from that experience than not. So I have a curiosity, but then I also have courage, I suppose, and I'm talking about myself, so that's weird, to just go and try. And then if those are two pillars, the third one of the stool would be, I'm okay with 80% is good enough. You know, I, I, I love Churchill's quote, um, to improve is to change, but to be perfect is to change often. And the reason I love that when he said in the House of Commons uh, during mm -hmm. World War II is that there is no such thing as perfection. Mm -hmm. To improve is to change, but to be perfect is to change often means to me there is no such definition of perfection. You must be willing to be at 80% and giving it a go and having the courage in which to do so and then just give her, you know, and just, just let your curiosity roam and continue. Just keep going. So again, uh, of the four platforms for speak, speak aid, it was like feed loop. All right. You know, what? let's give her, it's not going to be perfect, but otherwise we'll just learn on the fly. And will that possibly blow up in my face? Maybe. Um, but I'm willing to put myself out there and give it a go. Um, same thing with a virtual world at TELUS in 2010. Uh, same thing with not rehearsing a Ted talk. And just going out there and doing it, thinking I would just, whatever would happen and hope that I'm 18 minutes or less. I was, but I was like, yeah, I'll give it a go. Let's see if I can do, because I did, I was doing, I did four 
And I was like, oh, the fourth one I'll do differently. I'll just put the slides together and hope that I tell the stories correctly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, It worked. <laughs> so yeah, I guess. Best. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that those would be the, the three pillars, right? It's the curiosity, it's the courage, and it's that 80% is okay theory. Right. Yeah. That's a, and I, we love it. It's why you, you resonate with us because, uh, you know, and, and the curiosity, the shoes, of course, you know, that's <laughs> perfect with this group and, uh, and the, you know, the courage and it's, it's interesting. Rebecca and I have had this conversation many times around, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen? You know, if you try it, it doesn't work quite the way you want it. What did you learn from that? So you know, absolutely. I think that's great. Yeah. And to, to Rebecca's question about what do I, what I do after something happens, I definitely go back review. So I, I, I ride my bike a lot. So I, when I'm cycling, I'm often rethinking, okay, how, how, how did it go? What did I learn from another event or another exercise or something from, you know, 1985? And I'm constantly using my Evernote, so that's my little hint. Yes. And I'm, my Evernote is my place in which to record my thoughts on either activities, books, articles, events, talks, meeting people. What do I know about them? What did I learn about them? And it's just sort of this running diary, I guess, is my Evernote. So a lot of things go into that. Right, right. And that, um, yeah, I picked this up, uh, Jelmo. Good enough, let's move on. <laughs> yes, that's a good promo, exactly. That's a good yeah. one. Um, good. You spoke, uh, you used the term uh, liminality, and uh, I'm aware that some people may not have read uh, your book or your art. Your, uh, 2014 Harvard Business Review, you, worked, you wrote about it just before Purpose Effect, right? I guess it was part of Purpose Effect, really. And uh, so just explain it for those on the call that may not know what the hell we're talking about. Uh, so if I remember correctly, I think it was like the early 1900s and it was a uh, Belgian, uh, Arnold van Genup or Genup, I think, and whom, who kind of basically said, look, uh, it is up to leaders and in, in like when it's up to leaders to, to, to show up and to be there when there is a fork in the road or when there's a ditch to overcome, or whether there's a sea to cross. And he really called that sort of liminality. So when we're living in a liminal time, it's like a boom, something happened, and what are we gonna do differently? So, you know, an example would be the entire city of Gander, uh, from its mayor down on 9-11, you know, w wondering what to do with the 77 planes that landed in yeah. Gander, and it was like, oh, didn't expect that, but let's go into a liminal type of leadership. And it is doing whatever you can in that moment to ensure safety, collegiality, love, right, and so forth. And I've, I've always loved the thought, right? Like, because we really need to be leaders in liminal times at all times. It's just that the magnitude of the, um, the issue is different. So a pandemic and 9-11 is different than, you know, we didn't hit our numbers this, this quarter. And what do we do about that? Or a pandemic and 9-11 is different than, oh, we just got acquired. <laughs> How do I help my people in the acquisition? Those are different levels of magnitude, but they're, they're examples of liminal leadership. It's what are you doing to support your people in change? You're the one that's been elevated to the leader role. So it's up to you to lead your team through that liminal time. That's essentially the paraphrasing. Right. Now, Dan, your new book, we're, we're, you're supposed to be showing it now. Oh, okay, let me, if you let me host disabled attendee screen sharing. So I'll show you something. If you let me share my screen. Hold on, it's a minute. Then I'll show you a graphic that no one has seen because it just came in yesterday. Oh, wow. Great. Yeah, exactly. I ordered mine, by the way. <laughs> Did you really? Thank you. Yeah, of course. Okay. So, so this will be somewhere in the book, um, probably in the back cover or the front. We're not sure, but this is, this is basically lead care win. And the subtitle to the book is how to become a leader who matters. And really it's a, the, the, what I, what I talk about in the book is that 
In if you lead, you should care. If you lead by caring, you win. There's no prize, there's no medal. It's that you win the hearts and minds of your people. So I'm, it's a, I, I love book titles that have play on words to kind of also try to confuse people. Uh, that's, that's <laughs> it's just me in a nutshell. <laughs> How do you confuse great. people but relate, Dad? This so, is but that, great graphic because that's what you talked about in your talk at SpeakAid was the, uh, the nine lessons for leaders and here they all are. Yeah, so I, I went the route of, okay, it's, it's 2020 and everyone loves a great emoji or emoticon. So each of the nine lessons has its own associated emoji. And each of the nine lessons, when you get inside the book, have a couple stories and then why, why this doesn't happen. So here are the, the things that are going wrong with leaders. But then more importantly, here's what you ought to be doing to be relatable or to stay present or remain curious, et cetera. So I'm really looking forward to September 29th, but here you go. I thought for you, Jane and Rebecca, I would, Aww. I would show you this. Yeah. It's fantastic. I love it. <laughs> I awesome. love it. And I can't wait for the book. And yet, you know, it's always so wonderful to, because you, you just write in a really great way and we can really, you know, enjoy and learn and, you're a great storyteller. Thank you. Well, yeah. also when I'm out of Denise's hair, it keeps us married. So there's that. I'm I'm a you know need to stay away from her sometimes. So I go to my own space and then I reappear and she's happy. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. And it's yeah. it's interesting the the discussion around uh, curiosity. Rebecca and I have this conversation regularly too because I <laughs> that's one of the uh, top things about me is my uh, curiosity and um, the first time that it sort of hit me was with uh, Warren Bennis uh, book a number of years ago uh, called Geeks and Geezers yeah and uh, you know they were talking about leadership and one of the things was again curiosity but they he used the word which I had not heard before then of neoteny sort of the keeping the childlike curiosity as a leader which, yeah. i love that yeah. from uh from from neo natal that's there you go there you go exactly. so looking, looking forward dan what do you what do you think we should be uh focused on over the next three six months Well, if I'm if I'm a if, if I'm looking at that question from leaders to team, or am I looking at that as individuals, Jane? Leaders. Either. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, inevitably, I think what's what needs to happen is leaders finding ways in which to lessen the load. And so, what I mean by lessen the load is just because people aren't commuting an hour a day, uh, and just because you can have Zoom calls. To not. You don't need to add more work on and to have as many Zoom calls as possible. It sounds ironic because I'm a big believer in this, don't get me wrong, yeah. but yeah. what I'm seeing, what I'm seeing is that there's now a, um, there's an unintended consequence mm -hmm. of people feeling that they have to be on and, and like eyes open all the time staring at a laptop. So I, I do wish that there is a bit of a, okay, you know what? We're only gonna have so many Zoom calls or web-based calls and, and, and to think about, does it need to be 60 minutes? Could they be 30, for example, right? Just that would be number one. Number two is other ways in which to informally show that you're there for the team. So if that means sending over jelly beans through some sort of local courier service, or a, a pizza or a pie or just a card. Great, get something to their house or their flat or their condo that says you're there for them. And a little maybe hand scribe note, something. Like just something that shows you're there and do that a few times. But also because we have these devices, you know, a text or just a quick call. Um, I'm finding it does without the face, like without the web. So as long as we're increasing, I think the number of touch points, making those more frequent, but lessening the number of deliverables and or, you know, these video calls, I think that's going to be very key for the next three to six months. And, um, and then the last thing I'd say is 
there's, I, I'm kind of concerned right now about the mental health and wellness of employees. So from to the aforementioned point when we were talking about young kids at home and you've got so many parents who are now full-time uh, caregivers to their zero to five-year-olds because there's no nannies or daycare or whatever, right? And then you've got so many parents like me being a substitute teacher uh, for the junior school, middle school, senior school, whatever you look at, uh, kids, plus they're doing their work. So again, back to KPIs and load, if we haven't looked at the load and the KPIs and said, how do we help and adjust that? Because there's so much on the parents or just the individuals at home. And, and then you've got, they can't see their loved ones that may be in a hospital or a nursing home. Then you've got the psychological uh, issues that relate to I'm, I'm Netflix bored or I'm, I'm by myself. You know, some people are individuals living alone. And, and they're not allowed out, if you will, or can't see a lot of people. Like there's just all of that, Jane, the psychological yeah. health and wellness piece and mental wellness. I really yeah. urge leaders to be thinking about that. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Absolutely. And also the, uh, so I've been looking at this too, Dan, the rethinking of the work processes, because we took the work processes and we just put them online. We didn't yeah. do anything differently, right? Well, that's, that's, why I'm, that's why I'm taking umbrage with the new normal, right? Yeah. I, I don't like that term at all. It's the great reset. We have to reset how we do things. Yeah. Um, and if we just say it's the new normal, it sort of suggests that we're building it off of something that we already did. Well, no, this is yeah. our greenfield chance to reset everything. So let's do that. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Any, any last words before we... Uh check out and and let our brains go go wild uh it's biblical but i'm not even religious but it's love thy neighbor right i mean if we're if we're not like who are we what's the point yeah that's a good point to end any other comments from you rebecca um uh, no well you know that i would love that one yes but i'm a firm believer that zoom calls should not be more than an hour <laughs> <laughs> and uh and even our virtual uh, leadership development uh, institute that we've had to take virtual and we are doing it um, instead of meeting, you know, all day for three days, we're cutting it up into one hour chunks sort of every day. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. What a delight. Thanks, Dan. I've actually Thank never you met so you much for being here. When I'm, I'm, so, I'm so proud to be part of Generation Next. This is great. This is it. This is this it. Is it. And, uh, and thank you so much. We did have uh, 18 uh, people in the studio audience, which is awesome. pretty funny, actually, at one point, which is great. Thank you so much. And uh, Jane will be in touch with you about uh, Rumi and Chance and, uh, awesome. and virtual conferences, because I really want her to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I want to help. All right. Okay, you two. Thanks again. Ciao. Bye. Wow. Thanks, Dad. Thanks, everybody.